Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Moriana Garcia, and I am the scholarly communications librarian at the River Campus Libraries. I am here today with two of my colleagues, Sara Pugachev, also from River Campus, and Daniel Castillo from Miner, uh, URMC, to share with you some ideas on how to develop and manage your scholarly identity. So I will share my screen now. So again, uh, we are here today in this uh, graduate workshop 2021. Uh, again, this is a collaboration between River Campus Libraries and the and Graduate Education and Postdoctoral Affairs. And today we are gonna present about how to be famous and not infamous, establishing an online identity to get noticed. Um, we will have three presenters today, Moriana Garcia, Sarko Gachev, and Daniel Castillo, and we are part of the University of Rochester Libraries. Um, I will start with the big picture, making the case that is all about networks and connections. Sara will dive in into what we mean by scholarly identity and how to connect it to traditional and new metrics of impact. And Daniel will tie everything to funder policies and requirements. So where do we start? You as a node. As someone famous said a long time ago, no man or woman is an island. Even more in academia, where a big part of our identity as scholars is actually defined by our connections to others. Professionally, we tend to use the word networking a lot, but we do it intuitively without thinking much about the real meaning behind that expression. The day I realized that mathematical theories about networks actually applied to me, I experienced an epiphany. At that moment, I became aware that I was a node in a vast network and that my value to the network was defined by the number of connections I had, the quality of those connections, and their location in the network. So think about that. So what are the main components of an academic network? Traditionally, they tend to be related to four categories. The institutions you are affiliated with, your collaborators, your, your publications, and the venues where you publish. So the, the journals, for example. I would add one more, your funders. It is in the interrelationship of all those connections that creates your network. We know that it's a tough world for academics right now. We are living through what is called as an hyper-competitive period. In this type of environment, small things can make a difference. Uh, according to a recent book by Barabasi, a researcher of networks, performance drives success, but when performance can be measured, networks drive success. When you have a group of researchers with academic values that are too close to differentiate among them. Both are good, both are, have excellent publications, both have grants. Their networks will drive the result. In sum, we need to think about our professional networks in a more intentional and strategic ways in order to succeed. For academics, uh, a lot of the networking happens through scholarly communications. But because the academic environment is changing, scholarly communications are also changing. For example, new models of sharing scholarly information tend to be a lot more open and socially engaged than previous models. And what do we mean by scholarly communications? Is all the things that the scholarly creates uh, to share information, their writings, and the way that they are evaluated for quality and disseminated and preserved for future use. 
One of the most important changes happening in scholarly publishing is the growth in open access. A resource is considered open access when it is published digitally, free of charge, and free of most copyright restrictions. There are a lot of flavors of open access. The best known are the green and the gold. Green is the one for preprints, while gold is when articles are published in peer-reviewed journals. Here is a concise view of all the models. So let me explain a little bit more. In the traditional closed model, you submit a paper, that paper goes through peer review, and then is published in a journal. And to get access, libraries pay a subscription to the journal. So we pay the journal to have access. That's the traditional closed model. In the open access model, the libraries do not subscribe. The content, once it's published, becomes open to everybody. But of course, someone uh, still costs to pay uh, to publish open access. So someone has, has, has to pay for it. And it can happen through what we call APCs, article processing charges. This time is the author who pays the cost for publication or these uh, institutions can finance and, and pay for that cost. In the green model is institutional repositories that um, use it pay, pay for the infrastructure so you can submit your preprint for free. That is the green model. Um, you submit your preprint, is open to everybody and the infrastructure is subsidized by an institution. In the traditional gold model, the author pays a fee, the APC, the article processing charges, and once the article is published, is uh, open to everybody. Main difference in the gold models were journal, uh, there is a peer review process before publishing. In the green model, the peer review happens after publishing, in a sense, in the community. Um, another important trend in scholarly communications is a new focus on communicating with the public. This is a must do if you want your scholarship to, bo to be more equitable and socially engaged. There are some tools out there that can help you create more popular versions of your scholarly articles and distribute them through social media. And Kudos is one of those tools. In addition, most publishers nowadays share some marketing toolkits with scholarly authors that help them advertise their papers to the public. But engaging with the public can be tricky since it might require you to have an active social media presence. And in social media, the line between your personal life and your academic life can get blurred very quickly like two galaxies colliding. So are you going to keep those networks separate? Are you going to allow them to overlap? You also need to think carefully about your brand, the name that is going to identify your node in social media. Are you going to use your full name, the name of your lab, or create some funny avatar? Whatever you choose, you might get stuck with it for a long time, so think carefully. Once you have a brand, you need to choose your social media networks and be consistent across them. The same name, the same profile image. The most popular networks for academics are the usual Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Of course, managing social media accounts can be very time consuming, but there are tools like Hootsuite, which can help you schedule posts in advance or redistribute the information to all your social media accounts at once. You can even give controlled permissions to others to create content for you. So you can recruit your students and tell them it's training. Using online tools comes with a cost. If you log in, the company that owns the application you are using gets a signature of your activity attached to your name or IP address, a footprint that they can use or sell. And that includes everything you use in your regular scholarly work, 
publishers, search engines, databases, apps, social media platforms. In the digital world, your node becomes a data point. In sum, all the metadata that represents who you are in the scholarly environment, your degrees, your job, your funding, all the things you create and all the things you use, all that information can become attached to your data point. So it is in your best interest that all that information is accurate and complete, and whenever possible, under your control, not the control of others. Using a standard persistent e-identifiers or PIDs for your academic profile, your publications, and your materials and methods is the best way to both feed and control how your node is represented in the network. For example, using ORCID for your profile, using DOIs for your documents, using ROR, which is uh, an identifier for your organization. So everything is linked to the University of Rochester. Um, there are other uh, standards, like a funder registry for your funders. And in the materials and methods in your publications, you can add industry codes, CAS numbers, cell lines, string numbers, share your protocols. Uh, all that information that you link to yourself becomes part of your data point. Um, I will pass the baton to Sara now so she can explain more about how you can go about creating this personal uh, information network around you. Excellent. Thank you, Moriana. So uh, please bear with us while we very gracefully switch the screen share. So thank, thank you all and thank you, Moriana. That was a great point. We are data points, but what can we do about it? Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit um, about scholarly identity or online identity in general and then the metrics that come with it. And again, what can you do about them? So uh, feel free to put any questions as I'm talking in the chat. I'm going to try to monitor it. We'll see how well I do. So. What do I mean when I say scholarly identity or online identity? So what I really want to point out here is it's a multifaceted thing. It's not just what you publish. It's not just presented things. It's really what people find when they Google you. If you've never done the exercise yourself, highly encourage you to do it. You might find some strange things. You might find a doppelganger. Um, I used to have a more common name and there were lots of doppelgangers out there for me. Um, it's showing what you've done and what you might do in the future. So it's really this multifaceted beast. So what might be part of it? So it, it's your name, um, it's your areas of expertise, what you're interested in, it's where you went to school, it's where you work, it's your research outputs, it's any output. So it's publications, presentations, blog posts you've written, your social media is part of this. It's who you've worked with. It's your collabor collaborators. It's your impacts and engagement. Where are you active? What, what impacts are you ranking and what impacts are your work making? So why does this matter? Because as Moriana pointed out, if you're not creating your online presence, someone's out there doing it for you. And if you do that Google search of yourself, you'll find who is doing this for you. And you may not be happy about it. The other reason why you want to be aware of this and really try to get on top of it is you want to be the answer to this question. Do you know anyone who's good for this? And you want that to be you. So if someone searches your area of expertise, so for Moriana, if someone searches scholarly communication at Rochester, she wants to be the person that comes up. And I think she is. She's a great person to go to, but we need to make sure it's visible that she's the person to talk to about this. So scholarly identity, it's a, it's a network in and of itself. There's a lot of different components. So there's, there's social media that Moriana talked about. There's websites, blogs. There's these in-between tools we'll talk about that are kind of social media, but a little more website-y. And then there's identifiers, which Moriana got into, and I'll, I'll cover a little bit more about. So when we're thinking about these kind of in-between tools, so social media tools, scholar-specific tools, um, some good examples of scholar academic specific tools are ResearchGate and academia.edu. These are fine tools to use, but when we use them, it's important to raise some questions. 
Who controls or owns your identity when you're using these tools? If you are getting a tool for free, sometimes you're the product, right? So they have access to your data. They might use it. Some caveats with tools like these are, there's no promises for what uh, will happen to the sites. They're not promising to exist forever. Um, sometimes they have siloed metrics they use. Um, Academia.edu a few years ago got in trouble because they sent out emails offering a premium service. If you pay X amount of money, your research is gonna come to the top. So they might try to do different marketing techniques. Not that these are bad places to put your work or to make a presence. These are tools people are using, but it's important to weigh the cost of the tools and what you get from it. This is um, another great point. Um, there's a tweet here if you wanna read about it, but having a personal website is a great place to really seize control of your personal identity. And this is a little plug, we'll talk about this at the end, but we have an activity that you can walk through and very quickly get your own website up. It's not using, uh, it's using GitHub, which is an open source platform. So it's a little bit more flexible. You don't have to worry about some of those things we talked about with ResearchGate or academia.edu. Okay, um, so moving on to unique identifiers. So we have these platforms we're using, but how are our data points defined in the platforms? So unique IDs are, you know, a string of numbers or a string of characters that are assigned to you as an individual. This helps for two reasons. First, it's name dis disambiguation. So my name used to be Sarah Clayton. There are tons of Sarah Claytons out there. I think there's a philosopher named Sarah Clayton. There's a model named Sarah Clayton. I think I was the only Sarah Clayton librarian, but you still have to distinguish yourself. So for common names, or if you change your name, these identifiers are great because they move through the cycle with you. These identifiers are also an opportunity for you to claim authority and get credit for your work. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. This is my favorite example of unique identifiers ever. Everyone you know, has a favorite example of unique identifiers, and this is mine. And it's using my favorite unique identifier, ORCID. So um, I'll just walk you through this one. So I'm the 38th author complaining, oh, that's not great. No, that's not it. I am the 38th author on this paper with the name Wang. There we go. This is an actual paper. There are 38 people in this paper with the last name Wang. There are six authors who have the last name Wang comma Y. So how in the world would you even find yourself in there? How would people figure out who's who, who works where, who wrote what other papers, what is their area of expertise? You're just gonna have to randomly click each of these uh, and try to figure it out. That's where unique identifiers come in. So we have ORCID, Google Scholar, Researcher ID, Scopus, Publons, and these are some of the most common research identifiers that you'll find out there. I like ORCID a lot for a few reasons. So if we go back to these other ones, they're all tied to specific tools. So researcher ID is tied to a specific database, Web of Science. Google Scholar is tied to Google Scholar, doesn't communicate with other platforms. Scopus is an Elsevier product that works great with Elsevier products. Um, and Publons is also associated with researcher IDs. So, ORCID ID is great because it's system ag agnostic. So it can work with all sorts of different systems. It's open source. It's also 100% researcher controlled. Um, so it is yours to do what you want with it. You can put what's in the profile. You can set up auto updates, which is great. But if you don't want something in your profile, remove it. If something's not correct in your profile, you can fix it. It's 100% in your control, which is great. It also takes that controlled profile and it becomes the authority for other sources. And we'll talk about this in a minute with metrics. Um, it links, it's linked data, so it connects with other systems. And what's great too, as graduate students, this is yours to take with you when you leave. So you can update your education, you can update your employment. It is not tied specifically to University of Rochester or any institution, it is yours and it's also being required. So I said all these good reasons and you also might have to get an ORCID, but it's nice to get ahead of it. So let's move on to metrics. Um, so we have our own identity. We're kind of understanding what is out there about us online. Well, what do people do with that? What do these databases do with it? What are outsiders uh, doing with this information? So scholarly metrics are flawed, but scholarly metrics 
seek to translate the activities of knowledge production into measurable units called indicators. So what does this mean? So these are some examples. For researchers, we have stuff that's really heavy in the publications, like an H index. Or we have Twitter mentions. You could use a tool like Kudos to kind of get another metric, what's your influence. Um, article level metrics. Journal impact factor is one that comes up a lot. And it's, it's another one that's deeply flawed, but is used. Um, data code, kind of other, other types of work. Blog posts have their own metrics, um, alternative metrics like downloads and engagement. All of this uh, falls within this scope of metrics. So we're trying to we're trying to take things that we produce and somehow quantify them. And we do it three ways: input, output, and impact. So input, what what did it take to make this happen? Output, what knowledge, what was created as a result, and then impact. How is it affecting the community? How is it being received by the community? So output, it could be the publications, it could be patents, data sets, clinical trials, blog posts, uh, tweets could be an output, the number of tweets you have. Um, impact could be citations, it could be who you're working with. It could be news stories written about your work. It could be policy mentions. It could be engagement with your tweets. And uh, within, if we're thinking purely in, in the scholarly landscape and publications, these are the databases that are trying to track this. So we have Web of Science, Scobus, and Dimensions. And we have access to all these in the library, so you can go in and explore and see what's happening. And if something seems wrong, talk to your librarian. We're happy to help you figure out what's going on. Um, uh, we'll, we'll help you figure out what's happening and kind of work through these together. And I see the question, Ari, and I'm going to talk about that in just one moment. That's a really great question. Um, so when we, when we take, um, when we're looking at these, where are they getting their data? Where are these databases getting their data? First, it's what's submitted. So if it's a paper, um, what's being pulled off the paper? Did you put the name you want to be called correctly in there? Did you put um, your correct institution? Did you put University of Rochester? You'd be surprised by, uh, especially older papers, how many say University of Bodchester. So uh, that makes it harder for it to associate with you. Also, your ORCID data can feed all these systems as well. So with metrics, on the one point, who cares? Um, on the other point, who cares? This is why you might care. Um, so rankings are determined by metrics. Um, while this isn't really important on the individual level, it does influence how University of Rochester appears and having strong rankings help us, helps us attract, you know, the best colleagues or people to interact with, recruit good faculty. So that what is why it might be relevant to you as an individual. Collaboration, be the person people want to find when they're, when they're looking for an expert, be the person who comes up with linguists when you search linguistics or, uh, a decay. Be the person that is the answer to the question who would be good for this. And then finally, it saves time. So let's avoid bad data and take advantage of the linked data. So with ORCID, we can validate data. We can make these systems behave correctly. We can say, this is me, and this is the correct information about me. I'm sharing it with you. Please update your systems and have it correct. One thing I'll say about metrics in general, I've already said deeply flawed, um, but people are making strides on rethinking how we use these kind of indicators. So there's a really interesting um, movement called DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. It's designed by over 2,000 individual, 2,000 organizations, 16,000 individuals. And this, the goal of this declaration and this movement is to eliminate the use of journal-based metrics, such as journal impact factor, and how it's being used for funding, um, hiring, tenure, promotion, all those sorts of things. And instead, let's take a step back and assess metrics, um, assess research on its own merit, rather than by these large metrics. So um, if you're interested, definitely take a look at Dora. I think it's a very interesting movement. In the meanwhile, if you're interested in any of these metrics or the pieces I've talked about scholarly identity, get in touch with your librarian. We're happy to help. And um, on that note, I'm actually going to take a pause, Moriana, if it's okay to answer this question from Ari. So if you can't see the chat, Ari asks, 
when we're just starting out, how do we get noticed and put ourselves on the map? How do we brand ourselves? That's a really great question. And it's a really hard question. It's hard to get noticed when you're starting out. And you can use these tools we've identified, like Twitter, you can create an organ. So you can first put the pieces out there to make sure that you are in the public arena in the way you wanna be represented. And then you have to start engaging with people, engaging with tools. On Twitter, a good idea is to start following people with similar interests, retweet things you think are interesting, start to engage with the community. Um, if you build your personal website, which I hope you will after this, make sure that it's linked to from other pages where you have a preference. If you're thinking about how the web finds your website, it's through a process called, um, you can think about search engine optimization. So if you're linking to your website from, for example, a university page or your social media, that helps everyone kind of connect the pieces of yourself uh, together. I hope I hope that helps a little bit, Ari. I don't know if my colleagues want to answer that um, as well in any more depth. Um, yes, I think I agree with everything that Sara just told you. Uh, I, it's it's not easy. You you can first, as she says, make sure that your academic information is correct. And the best way now, the best tool for that is Orchid. If you want them to engage in social media and start having this social media presence, it, depending on the discipline, there are Twitter uh, feeds that are extremely active where people share news, uh, new discoveries, their papers. And she's, as she said, create a Twitter account, think about your brand, think how, what your name is going to be, um, and, and start linking to the things that matter to your academic life and, and to people that matter. And start and think of this as work. In a sense, I think of social media as work. It's not something that I enjoy, uh, but it is part of my work. And you can use the tools like Hootsuite to make that work easier. So you can dedicate one hour every two weeks just to create the post and Hootsuite will release them in their right time at the time uh, when, when you want them. And start creating that network. Think of, about everything uh, connecting to you and connecting to uh, your um, scholarly work, in a sense. I hope that helps. So, Daniel. I also just wanted to really quickly add, um, just emphasize what Sarah said. You're not alone here. You have lots of great librarians. On the medical center side, we have ladies and librarians as well who we can put you in contact with. So if you do need help trying to figure out sometimes, you know, how to get that paper, I saw a really good question in here about if you can attach an article to ORCID without a DOI, go ahead and reach out. If you don't know who your liaison librarian is for the medical center side, you can reach right out to me. Um, otherwise I say, go ahead and reach out to Sarah Moriana and we can get you set up so that way you're not doing this all by yourself. All right, so I will pull up my presentation and hopefully share this correctly as well. All right, so good afternoon. My name is Daniel and I'm one of the librarians at Minor Library in the Medical Center. I'm gonna briefly discuss grants and some different resources available to help you manage your grant identity. So for today's presentation, I'm gonna explain some of the requirements for staying compliant with federal access policies from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. I will show a few tools available through the university to help measure and analyze your research impact. And I will review a couple of resources that can help you prepare for a grant. Finally, I will cover some tools that you can use to review grant information and record and report your activity with grants. So this is probably not surprising, but much of my talk will be centered around the NIH and NSF funding. By no means does this suggest that these are the only two federal agencies that you have to be worried about maintaining compliance with. Um, just in fact, the next few uh, slide, I will be showing some federal agencies that a list of federal agencies that have, require you to also share your articles and data. But the reality is that the majority of funding at the University of Rochester comes from the NIH and NSF. Looking at roughly the last 10 years, you can see that we've received over $1.5 billion from the NIH and almost $200 million from the National Science Foundation. So here's that list of federal agencies that have federal access policies that you will also have to adhere to if you receive funding from them. Um, in addition to some of the benefits like assisting with reproducibility and the convenience of hosting articles in one location, there is a very practical reason these policies exist. 
If public tax dollars are being used to fund this research, then the products of that research should be freely available to the public. Over on the medical center side, we have the most experience dealing with the NIH public access policy. Of course, this makes sense given that we've received over 4,000 grants from the NIH. Uh, this policy has been in place for about a decade now, having started off in 2008. Uh, essentially, this policy states that if you receive any funding from the NIH on a peer-reviewed paper, you have to make sure that article is freely available through PubMed Central. For many larger journals, that uh, many larger journals, they will help you actually go through this process and do a lot of the work for you. Um, but if you do need any help with any parts of this process, please reach out to the library because we're available to help. A uh, quick note about submitting articles to PubMed. You can't actually use the version that appeared in the journal. So try to do a good job of keeping your author manuscripts because that's what you'll need to submit to PubMed Central. Um, here are a few exceptions that might make your work exempt from having to submit to PubMed Central. So even if you have received funding through the NIH on a book chapter or dissertation, your work is exempt from the policy. In this case, you can use my NCBI uh, accessible through PubMed to claim an exemption if you qualify according to any of these rules. The National Science Foundation policy is more recent and only applies to articles that were published in 2016 or after. Otherwise, the essentials are the same. Any article that's been published that was peer reviewed and received NSF funding has to be uploaded to the National Science Foundation Public Access Repository. So you might be asking, why do you really care about all these federal access policies? Well, the short answer is because what will delay processing means is that they're gonna cut off your grant funding uh, if you're not in compliance with either the NIH or NSF funding. That is usually when the library gets called. When one of our researchers receives that NIH email that says, if you want more funding in the future, you're gonna to need to get your article on PubMed Central. Please do not hesitate to call us if you get one of these emails, but I would also encourage you not to wait. If you know you have an article that is not in compliance, contact us right away to take care of it uh, you really do not want to be working on this at the same time you're working on an active grant submission. So speaking of grant submissions, the library is available to assist with research impact metrics that will be helpful when applying for grants. Broadly speaking, there are five domains that you can use to measure your impacts of your grants. Advancement of knowledge, clinical implementation, benefits of the community, legislation and policy, and economic benefit. But how do you determine the actual impact of your work? We have some tools that will be uh, able to help you with the first one I'll discuss is SciVal. SciVal is available through Scopus. This is a great place to start when you're looking for those traditional impact metrics, citation-based metrics. SciVal also offers the chance to measure impact beyond these metrics by including options to measure traditional publication metrics, both print and online, as well as information about how this research has been used for patents. You can use the research to measure impact of the entire institution, individual or group of researchers, or a collection of publications. We can also generate reports that you can use to inform or even include directly into your grant submissions. Uh, I know we had a couple of questions about alt metrics before. This is the next tool that I'll be discussing. We can get impact metrics for an institution, an individual, a group of researchers, or a collection of publications, or even at the funder level. Um, this has been helpful a couple of times as we've worked on projects where somebody might be looking at the research impact of a particular cohort, for example, a group of fellows, and using this in order to apply for grants. Uh, one quick note about Altmetric. While the data used by SciVal comes from Elsevier and specifically the Scopus database, the data used by Altmetric is supplied by the institution. On the medical center side, we collected this data from the researcher profile system, the same system we use to populate the information for researcher and clinical clinician profiles on the uh, web. This data is not clean and there might be inconsistencies. If you do notice that with your uh, profile, reach out to us and we can check to make sure that all your work is on there correctly. What makes Altmetric different from SciVal and other citation-based metric systems is what they measure. Altmetric scores include activity from several online resources, including Wikipedia, Twitter, data mining from Mendeley, and research blogs. This can provide a fuller picture than simply relying on metrics, uh, citation metrics alone. Altmetric offers impressive visualizations that can also be included in grant submissions and other reports. Grants you have received also influence your scholarly identity. The Dimensions database offers a helpful resource for looking up grant information. The Dimensions database also offers information about research or publications, data sets, grants, patents, clinical trials, and policy documents. Not every grant found on Dimensions will have all this information included, but Dimensions grant data typically includes the funder information, 
which organizations and researcher were awarded the grant. Similar grants, publications and the clinical trials receiving funding from the grant and the total award, amount awarded. You can even look up the mentions data at the institutional research funder or the category or research category level. The data comes from either the funding organization or public sources. You can see a full list of their data sources on the link on this slide. So I suspect no one will be surprised to find out that I am also a fan of ORCID. As you consider how to best manage your scholarly identity, ORCID really is the best way to organize and track your research activities. One of the nice things about ORCID is how well it links to other scholarly resources. Using ORCID, you can search and link any of your grant information that is available through Dimensions. You can also manually add in any grant information that is not included in Dimensions. Similarly, you can use My NCBI to import this data into your Science CV to use with your NIH Biosketch. The NIH Biosketch is a requirement for all NIH and AHRQ grant applications. Keeping this information complete and up to date will strengthen your case when applying for grants in the future. And using ORCID can make it easier by cutting down on the amount of redundant work that you have to do by entering this into information to multiple places. All right, so that's gonna bring us to a close. I just wanna thank you for sharing your time with us. I and the other librarians from Rush Rees and mine are always available to help, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, at Minor, we do conduct biomedical literature searches, including systematic reviews. Uh, we are available to help with research impact metrics and uh, can create custom reports. And of course, uh, we can help you navigate those public access policies to make sure you don't risk receiving one of those delay in processing emails from the NIH. So I'm gonna look to see what questions we have on here now. I see some comments uh, from Sara um, about BioSketch that is also used by the NSF and is helpful and, and really helpful. Yeah, it's not required by the NSF right now, but you can do it and it can save a lot of time. That's what I think a lot of these tools are about, even the social media tools, Moriana mentioned like uh, Hootsuite, like doing this is a lot of work. So if we can come up with ways to save time, and I think we all agree that ORCID is a great way to save time with this because linked data and pushing to other systems, but other things like Hootsuite using my and CBI. So um, it's a lot of work to maintain an identity. And so anything you can do to simplify the data source that's driving your identity is a great idea. Um, I would add just a little bit to one of the questions uh, about when you start. If you remember about what are the academic networks? It, they are related to, to your institutions, they are related to the people that you collaborate with, your co-authors, your publications, your journals, and your funding. What you need to start thinking is, what is the easiest of those networks that you can start working on and influence more easily? And I would tell you that the collaborators, perhaps, is the one where you can work a lot more. So increase your network, talk to people, uh, connect to people in a lot of different ways, through conferences, uh, through other uh, researchers that can put you in contact. Talk to people, increase your network and, uh, of collaborators or authors or people in academia that know you and, and can talk to you. That I think is the first recommendation for graduate student because that network, the people network is the easiest for you to influence and grow uh, more quickly. Then you move on to the publications, publish as much as possible in a sense, and also the venues, the journals, where do you publish? And of course, grants, funding, where do you apply? So, so think about your networks as the, sp the spaces where you want to grow your presence. That's a great point, Moran. And I think it actually goes back to something that, that Brooke at, uh, raised in the chat. So altmetrics, how do you increase that score? A lot of it is about the network you have and how you promote yourself sometimes. So you do have to do some self-promotion. So for example, for your all metric scores, one of the big things that's taught, like one of the big indicators that comes up is Twitter mentions. How often do people mention you on Twitter? How often are they engaging in tweets? So the first thing Daniel mentions is, yeah, make sure what's being referenced in the tweet is up to date. Make sure there's a DOI. You need a DOI for a publication for all metrics to track it. And then become engaged in the community that might be interested in this. So on Twitter, sometimes you can find Twitter lists of, so for example, if you're 
um, a biologist, they're probably way more specific than biology would be a good place to start, but you can look through and find like key biology researchers or people in your subdomain that you want to follow and start following them, engage with their tweets. Um, then when you publish something or when you have something you want to share, tweet about it in a way that adds some value. So like, oh, I'm doing this interesting research. You can read about it here. And then when people engage with your tweet, you know, respond to them and also engage with other people's tweet and build kind of your community there. So it's it's really a lot of networking um, online. Like Moriana said, it's a lot of work, but one of the first things to do is make sure your what you're sharing is in order. You can do preprints, which is a great idea to share things early, as long as it has a DOI uh, for alt metrics, and then build up that community. And it takes a long time and it's slow, but you'll find people. Uh, you can find your Twitter people out there. Um, they're, they're real people, but I call them Twitter people. You can find people online. <laughs> I don't see any questions, so I will share my screen to talk a little bit about the asynchronous activity where you can create your own website. Oh, so uh, to, uh, as a companion to, to this workshop, we have created a website, and you see the address there. Uh, let me put the address on the chat, control C, so you can, you can go right there. And this website has all the information that is going to allow you to create, to build your free personal academic website. One thing that you know, we know is that the University of Rochester doesn't allow graduate students to create their own websites in the university servers. So you need, if you need uh, to have your own website where you can share your resume, your research, your interests, you need to go beyond the university. This exercise will allow you to create that website in GitHub. Uh, so it's completely free. It's under your control. When you graduate, you take it with you. And uh, please visit the website. All the information is there. It is based on Jekyll Academic, created by uh, North Carolina State University Libraries, and includes the ability to do blog posts, uh, have your resume, a link to all your social media tools. And as, I, as we said, is in GitHub pages. So it's very, it's free and, and you can control uh, yourself. It's, this program is for beginners, so you don't need any special coding skills. We explain everything in excruciating detail in a PDF with screenshots. So you can you can do it. If I can do it, I created my website. If I did it, you can do it. Okay. And here it is. Uh, a lot of people working on this uh, activity uh, for the website. Uh, Aidan Sawyer was our first uh, main programmer, and Sarap and Lara Nicosia, Sarap Pugacheva and Lara Nicosia worked with him to develop the website. Um, for the tutorial, Allegra Tennis, Sara Siddiqui, and myself worked on that tutorial. As you can see, you start with a River Campus Libraries template, and by following the instructions, you end up with your own academic website. So um, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please um, ask your librarian, contact us, contact Sarah, myself, any librarian that works with your department, and we can try to answer your questions and help you uh, go through the, through the tutorial if you need help. I'm going to stop sharing now. And we can, Dan uh, graciously shared a website he built from this template last year, uh, earlier version of this template. It's a little easier now, Dan, I hope. But um, th thank you for sharing that and check it out. It's a nice website. And we'll stick around in case anyone has questions. But just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope this was useful. And contact your librarian if you have uh, questions down the road.